Welcome, my friends, to the Far Post podcast presented by Esports Gaming League. Yes, we have a brand new presenting sponsor. We're very excited about it. We look forward to that partnership blossoming and integrating Esports Gaming League into the show moving forward. So that's an exciting way to start our podcast today. Also exciting, the fact that the podcast is back, and so are the Rebs, who opened the 2021 season this past Saturday night with a 2-2 draw at Chicago Fire FC. All four goals scored inside the opening 30 minutes. It was all gas, no breaks to start the season, and it's all gas, no breaks on the podcast as well, as it always is. I'm Jeff Lemieux, joined by my co-host, Elizabeth Bahoda. Elizabeth, it's been a few days now. Have you had a chance to process that game on Saturday and just kind of breathe following the, the hectic start to the season? Yeah, I was just on the edge of my seat that whole first half with the goals just banging in. But I think now that's set in and the anticipation and excitement for the home opener with fans is what's really on the horizon and and keeping me going through the week. Yes, very, very much looking forward to the return of fans to Gillette Stadium on Saturday. We know the players are as well. And we are so excited to have with us today a player who begins his second professional season after a standout rookie year with the Revs. I've unofficially crowned him 2020 MLS rookie of the year since they absurdly did away with the (laughs) award at the worst possible time. It's long legs himself, Henry Kessler. Henry, thanks for joining the show. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you guys for having me. And uh, I appreciate the rookie of the year (laughs) shout out. Um, But yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Hey, no one can take that away from you that I unofficially crowned you rookie of the year that you'll have that for the rest of your life. I'll have that forever. (laughs) They can't take that away. It's true. At at, uh, the game right after they took away the award, Jeff kept saying, presented by Jeff Lemieux, the 2020 MLS Rookie of the Year, Henry Kessler on our pregame show. (laughs) The more and more you say it, it, it's it's the thing. If you just speak it into existence, that it's true. All right. Well, Henry, uh, we were talking a little bit about that that opener on Saturday and just kind of how crazy certainly the first 30 minutes of the games were. uh, The game was. I just want to ask, as a player, you know, what were those? first 30 minutes like on Saturday night because there's so much buildup and there's so much anticipation ahead of a season opener and then you kick the game off and inside 11 minutes you're down to nil and then within 16 minutes from there you're back to 2-2 like what kind of goes through your head when you're on the field for 30 minutes like that to start a season yeah not not an ideal start (laughs) um going going down to nil in uh, 11 minutes but um Adam's goal was really crucial for us, uh, getting one back quickly. I think it was within five minutes of their second goal. And then uh, Gustavo's goal after that, really good throw by uh, Brandon and that good cross by Tejan. But, um, yeah, hectic, hectic first half. Um, it was going to be a, a quick game um, coming into it. You know, their home openers, Bruce was saying, they're always difficult. Um, you know, a lot of energy, especially they're welcoming fans back too. So uh, it, it was always going to be a quick start. Um, and unfortunately we fell behind, but I think we did rally, uh, did well to rally, rally back. In those moments when it's the 11th minute of a season opener and you do go down till do, do go down to nil and you kind of feel it, you know, going a little wrong in, in that moment, who is it on the field? Who kind of, who kind of takes charge and steps up and says, all right, guys, look, settle down. We're going to figure this out. Like who is the kind of the vocal leader in those moments? I think it's a lot of guys. Um, I think Andrew Farrell, for sure, you know, really experienced defender. Um, That's the one I hear the most because he's right next to me. I think Matt Turner speaks a lot, too. Um, I think Carlos as well, you know, more in Spanish than English. But uh, uh, I think he's vocal and uh, ample. But um, and then I think Adam Adam is growing in in confidence as well. and, And his goal really, really helped us. So I think it's a bunch of guys, but um, I think we lean a little bit more on the veterans. How did you feel like the group kind of responded from the 11th minute on? Because I know obviously you can't really take out the first 11 minutes. They're part of the game and they happened. But from the 11th minute on in terms of the full team performance and in terms of the defensive performance from, from your perspective, how did you feel like the group had responded from minute 11 on? Yeah, it was something Bruce said after the game. He goes, yeah, we didn't concede for 80 80- plus minutes after that, which was good. Uh, so I thought, um, obviously, we didn't start well, but defensively after that was pretty sharp. Um, and then uh, we created many chances. In the first half, I thought we could have had three, four goals. Um, so I, I thought, and then towards the end, you know, Kizza hitting the crossbar and a few other 
close moments. Um, but it was, it was a good response. And I thought a decent performance outside the first 10 minutes, but like you said, obviously you can't just close those first 10 minutes out. Um, but you know, so it's something we'll work on, uh, this coming weekend and, uh, I hope to start better. Henry, as far as coming into this year, you know, you think back to a year ago and you were coming into your rookie season. How do you feel like you started the game a little bit differently as you're heading into your second year? Like how did those emotions vary as you headed into the season opener? Yeah, a, a little bit more confident, um, you know, less nervous, um, more vocal. I think I think of myself as one of the guys that should be talking. You know, I see almost the whole field. So uh, I, I should be one of the more vocal players, um, whereas I, I don't think that was really on my mind coming into last year. Um, but, uh, you know, being more vocal, trying to be more of a leader. Um, and last year was just, you know, try to play well and help the team. But this year, you know, trying to increase my role within the squad. And you mentioned Andrew Farrell being one of those vocal leaders as well. And you played alongside him in the season opener. You guys obviously played together so much last season and formed that central defensive partnership, but then you didn't have much time together in the preseason because you were obviously with the, the U.S. under-23 team in the CONCACAF and with the qualifying championship. So I talked to Andrew Farrell after that preseason finale against LAFC when you guys had played your only preseason match together, and he said, look, it's going to take a little bit of time for us to kind of you know just connect again on that, that central defensive partnership because – yes, we played a ton together last season, but we haven't played together in four months. Like we need to kind of rekindle that. So uh, do you kind of get that same sense that you just, you just need a few games together to kind of get that feeling back? Yeah. And I think even, even now more so than against LAFC in each and every day, we're, we're getting more and more of that cohesion back. Um, I think something that's worth noting is that, you know, when you're at, with a different team, you're playing a different system, different style. Um, so also different in coaching uh, plays a part. So it's, it's more of an adjustment for me, not, not so much for Andrew, you know, he's been, he had a full preseason with the Revs, So, which is great. Um, but, you know, for me, just getting back to things that we, we do differently here um, than, than I did with the under 23 team. Uh, so making those adjustments. And then, like you said, getting more, more comfortable with each other again and re with each other. Um, and, and I think we should get better as the, the season goes on. One topic that it's weird. It seemed like it came up again on Saturday, despite the fact that it had been a topic of conversation all of last year was the same day travel. It seemed like some people were almost surprised that the team was traveling the same day and wondering whether that was going to be an advantage or a disadvantage or what would it be. But obviously that's something that you guys have gotten used to for you at the professional level. You don't really know much different because you did that basically all of last season, your rookie year. Um, but that same day travel at this point is continuing for the most part. And that's something that Bruce Arena has said. He hopes maybe sticks around in certain situations, even after we're beyond the pandemic, because he thinks it actually might work better for teams to travel day up game. So I was just interested to get your take on, on having kind of had a year of that now, how you felt about that same day travel, because it is a little bit different than maybe American sports fans are used to. Yeah, it's different than what I'm used to too. So um, <laughs> it's, um, it's different for all of us. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with Bruce on that. I think uh, some of the older guys with families, maybe maybe they don't want to be away from home too long. You know, that's stuff outside of sport that you have to consider. But for me, I, I'd much prefer to go a day earlier, especially when you have a two hour plus flight um, to Chicago. It's not ideal. But that being said, you know, we didn't make excuses and uh, we were we stayed in a nice hotel. We were well prepared, ate good meals and left, left enough time in the morning where, uh, we were able to prepare well, well enough. Um, but I still think, you know, if you're flying two plus hours, you should be going the night before. But, um, you know, that being said, it, it's not the worst thing in the world. And uh, I, we certainly can deal with it. So speaking of those same day travels and, and with that, like two hour flight you mentioned on the way home. I'm curious, Henry, what does it look like on a Sunday when you guys have off and you got back really late? Do you take the time to kind of sleep in and, and you know, like rest your body a little bit more? Or are you the type of guy that, you know, has an intrinsic clock that gets you up at, I don't know, 730 or something every day because you're used to going to training and being in for testing? Yeah, so we got back very late because uh, also the time difference. So we really, if it was a 730 kickoff there, we really kicked off at 830. 
Um, and then we had to eat, shower, then go to the airport, fly back. So I was in my bed at 4 a.m. pretty late. Um, and uh, That's late. so, yeah, I, I was certainly not waking up um, early. So I slept in, didn't even set an alarm and got up at, I think, close to noon. So okay. it kind of it kind of throws you off a bit um, with your sleep schedule because then I wasn't tired like until midnight or later than, you know, going into the next night. So that's just another reason why I'm not a huge fan of the same day travel. But um, yeah, I think there are guys that, you know, woke up at seven, eight, because Brad was telling me he had to take his kid to a soccer game or, um, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's tough. But um, yeah, I, I tried to sleep in as much as possible. <laughs> I appreciate that you have that ability to sleep for that eight hour period. I feel like my body usually would wake me up. at still eight o'clock and say, nope, time to get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, are you are you a napper at all like if you if for whatever reason you have to get up early are you a good napper because some people like I'm not a great napper it's tough to sleep in the middle of the afternoon how do you do with it occasionally occasionally I like a nap um, <laughs> but uh it's I, I try to do it earlier rather than later um because I think once you start getting to like three four o'clock then you know there's a, a fine line there because then you're napping oh hour hour and a half say that's a long nap. And then next thing you know, you can't fall asleep. So if I'm napping, I try to make it earlier in the day. Um, so I can still get to sleep at a good hour. It's I the smart move. That. That's what yeah. happened to me on Sunday. So, you know, we weren't on the trip, but we're still doing post-game work here. So I was working until 2 a.m. or so. I didn't go to bed until about 2.30. But then we had to be in, staff who didn't travel had to be in for a COVID test at 8 a.m. on oh. Sunday. So I slept like four hours and then I ended up, I ended up falling asleep on my couch kind of unintentionally from like six to nine, which is the worst possible time to take a nap. I slept straight through dinner. Then you wake up at 9 PM and you're like, what do I do now? Like, do I hang out for two hours? What I, it's the worst. So that is, that is definitely the, the thing to do. If you can take a nap, get it in early in the afternoon. See, for me for on sure, days yeah. like that, I like, I, I was just nervous. I was going to miss my alarm the next morning for the COVID test. So like, I didn't really sleep. I'd like wake up every hour and be like, what time is it? <laughs> yeah. Always set, always set two alarms. Never, I never set one. So <laughs> I second <right>. that rule. <laughs> well, look, speaking, speaking of travel and sleeping in your own bed and all of that, it has been a crazy couple months for you. I mean, it's something like, I know you posted on social media, it was something like 43 days straight wow. away from home from starting in a U.S. under 23 camp in Guadalajara and then being named to the roster for the CONCACAF Olympic qualifying championship and then going straight from Guadalajara to L.A. to meet up with the Reds for preseason. So you know, did you at that point, do you just kind of forget what it's like to even sleep in your own bed? Like, what's it like being on the road for 43 straight days? You completely forget what home is like. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an afterthought. Um, so, yeah. I mean, just to give give perspective, I left in, in February and didn't sleep in my bed again until April. So oh, like wow. Mar March, March didn't even happen. I wasn't here a day in March. Um, so, yeah, uh, it was a long trip, but um, obviously one that I was glad to be a part of, um, you know, similar conditions to uh, the bubble in Orlando where, you know, I mean, actually, I think Orlando was better because you were in a resort. You could go to the pool, stuff like that. Um, we were pretty much limited to two floors, um, just our rooms and then where we ate. Um, but obviously those were the precautions we needed to take um, to stay safe. So uh, we took those. Um, sorry, am I cutting it? Oh, okay, okay, I'm good. No, I think you're good. Uh, sorry, you're good. I, I, thought, I thought I cut out there for a second. But um, yeah, so we needed to take those precautions. Um, and then after Guadalajara, uh, Tejan and I were straight to LA and then a five day quarantine there. And then obviously finished out the rest of preseason. Um, but yeah, lot, lots of time in the hotel, lots of card games, um, lots of stuff like that to try to keep ourselves entertained. But I, I was glad to be home when, I, when we finally did come back. What's your favorite card game? Sorry, say that again. What's my favorite card game? Uh, my favorite card game. Uh, there's this one I learned called uh, 33, um, where players, you try to get, I mean, three aces is like ideal. And you like exchange cards and to like a face card would be 10 and ace is 11. Um, but they have to be the same suit. 
So you're exchanging cards, trying to get your score up. Okay. Or you could go for three of a kind, which is like an automatic win. Uh, and then you get to take a life from someone else. Ooh. So you could either go for the same suit or three of a kind. So it's it's a tricky game um, that I liked. And I, I introduced it to the guys here. And we've been playing it a lot. Nice. Very cool. I'm going to have to try oh. that one. I know when you got home from LA, it was sort of similar to coming home from Chicago. We got back really late at night slash early in the morning. So when you walk in your door after 43 days on the road, what was the first thing you did when you walked in the door after 43 days? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I think I laid on my bed. <laughs> I missed my bed. I think my bed's pretty comfy. Um, and, you know, it's amazing how it was so much time. I don't know why I... I think I expected things to be the same, but I was a little surprised when they were like coming into my room, you know, everything's still in the same spot. <laughs> but uh, I was like, oh, wow, everything actually is in the same spot, you know, it just just how I left it. Um, so it was it was just a weird feeling being back and then like easy car rides that I did in the next couple of days were difficult, didn't remember how to get to Chipotle, which was unheard of for me because I frequent that place like crazy. But um, yeah, so so it was an interesting experience. What would you have done if you'd walked into your room and everything wasn't in the same place? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I would have had a lot of questions. I would I have wondered like... what happened. I, would, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, to be fair. <laughs> you seemed blown away that it was in the same place. I'm wondering what your reaction would have been if you'd walked in and been like, oh, no, this isn't my room. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know why I just... It was almost like too good to be true that, that yeah. it had been so much time yeah. and nothing changed. Um, but but yeah, I'm, I'm glad it was. <laughs> Are you the type of person that likes to leave everything like organized and clean when you leave so that when you come home, it looks like nice and fresh? Because that, that's something when I leave my house, when I travel, I like to make sure everything's like spotless. So when I get back, there's no like, you know, animosity with why is everything all over the place? <laughs> I'm, I'm the exact same way. So I made sure to vacuum meticulously. Um, I made my bed, um, you know, really organized things, made sure everything was in place. Cause I got back that that would be like a sensational feeling yeah. like to go into a clean bed, freshly washed sheets. Um, so I was like, I, I did plan a little bit, um, <laughs> knowing it was going to be a while, not knowing exactly how long, but uh, knowing it was going to be a while until I came back. So I did get back to a nice, a good, a good thing. I like the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm interested to know too, what, when you go on the road for 43 days, what packing looks like, because I understand that there are laundry services available, but at the same time, like we go on an 18 day road trip to LA. I pack pretty heavy for an 18 day road trip, just cause I'm, I'm like a safe kind of guy. I'm like, I'm going to bring enough clothes that I know I'm going to get through 18 days. What if there's not laundry available, whatever, whatever. But some guys will go on an 18 day road trip or a 25 day road trip. And they get on the bus with like a little duffel bag. And I'm like, what is in there that's getting you through 25 days? So what does packing look like for you when you're on the road for 43 days? I'm, I'm that guy with a little <laughs> duffel bag. Um, that, yeah, that's close my mind. Um, yeah, look, I, I pack extremely lightly. It's uh, something I learned from just think it, there's less to keep track of. You know, if you bring less, you can lose less. Um, kind of, fair. Kind of fair. Makes it, it makes it easier for myself. And um, also when we were in uh, Guadalajara that, you know, they were giving us clothes to wear every day. So that helped to wear the, the issued gear to, to meals and around the hotel, whatever. So we couldn't even wear our own clothes if we want 32 days out of the equation right there. Yeah. And then I just needed to pack a few <laughs> things um, for LA. And uh, luckily Scott Edmonds uh, brought a separate bag with all my revs gear um, straight to LA. So I didn't even need to bring that. So I didn't even have to check a bag the whole trip, Wow, which was great. Wow. Yeah. Which was really great. Yeah, and I, I get for the players, like I understand it more because you do have your team gear that's getting washed every day. You know, I feel like I can't really, I would feel so bad if I was going to Scott, our equipment manager every day and be like, Hey, can you wash my clothes for me? Can you wash my clothes for me? So I try, I try to like bring enough revs gear that I've got like 18 days of revs gear just in case I can't do laundry. Now Scott would absolutely do laundry for me every day if I wanted him to, but I just feel bad about it. So I just bring like a, a 
massive bag full of 20 days worth of reds deer and it's it's absurd that's fair that's fair yeah that's safe i i feel like you're you were well prepared for for either scenario so can't blame you i mean when you're a woman you have to throw in the fact that you need so many different kinds of shoes like sneakers boots like all your different raincoats you guys have it easy (laughs) (laughs) i will say in the entire 18 days in la i literally i brought two pairs of shoes just thinking i was going to need a second pair of sneakers for some reason and never wore them i wore the same pair of shoes the entire 18 days so at least i was able to (laughs) i was able to get through on that but uh, so Henry, you packed, you packed super light for a 43 day trip, but what was, what was the most important item that you had on the road with you think for, if you're going on the road for 43 days? Most important item. And I, I did forget some things to be clear. Um, forgot to bring them or pro- left them in like Mexico. No, no, no. Forgot <laughs> to bring them. Okay. So I, re- I remember uh, getting in the Uber to Logan on the way to Guadalajara and I left these three books that I want. And I was like, man, if the one trip that I first would have been perfect, you know, pretty much locked away in our rooms, you know, what's going on that we can really do, reading would have been perfect. Like, e- even I get tired of Netflix, you know? So <laughs> I was upset that I forgot those. But the most important item, I would say, was my phone. Um, unfortunately, I had a, uh, I still brought my computer, but I had an issue that dates back to January. And um, I brought it to the Apple store. This was uh, right before the US camp in Florida. So I brought it to the Apple store the day before I was going to go to Florida. And I was like, all right, this would be nice to have, you know, we, we won't be able to leave the tab. My computer's useful, could watch shows, whatever. Um, brought it to the Apple store, made an appointment too. Like I didn't just show up, I made an appointment. The genius uh, bar. Get there. Yeah, I, I get there. I get there and the guy goes. Oh no, we um, lost, we lost here's... Henry right in that pivotal yeah, moment. The we just lost line. you for like three seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was like, what did he say? Um, so I said to the guy at the genius bar, um, yeah, I have a problem with my MacBook. The volume doesn't work. And, um, on, um, oh, I'm not actually like a tech guy. Um, we're going to have to check your computer in for 48 hours. And I go, no, 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 no. I leave tomorrow. <laughs> I leave tomorrow. You can't like, what was the point or what was the point of making the appointment if you're not a tech guy? So I was a little bit upset. The computer never got fixed. <laughs> I bring it to Guadalajara. Oh. It still doesn't work. Like the volume still doesn't work. Um, but I, I use it, you know, I mean, the Wi-Fi still works. So if, if it, but I had to watch phone uh, shows on my phone. So my phone was absolutely essential during this trip. Um, and I recently got a new phone cause I was working on a broken iPhone seven. So it's been a while. Thank God I upgraded cause I really needed it. So the most important item that I brought was my phone. Wow. So yeah, I think yep. we could tell from, you know, everybody does the pregame Insta story on the field. You go into a new stadium and do the pregame Insta story. We could always tell yours, the camera just seemed like it wasn't, it was a little <laughs> off. And all of a sudden one game is this crystal clear picture. And it's like, Hey, Henry got a new phone. Got a new phone. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was more than a little off. Um, it had a crack and Teal, Teal says, is it a foggy day every day? Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how he responds to my stories. So, but yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad I upgraded. Yeah. Which phone did you get? What version are you up to now? The 12 pro. Oh, big um, upgrade. So I think it's like, Big upgrade, yeah. huge upgrade. Yeah, so it's the uh, it's the newest. One. I didn't get the like 12 Pro Max. Uh, this phone is pretty big, so I, I don't think I need any size bigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was for sure worth it. That's awesome. All right. Well, you were obviously in Guadalajara for a long time for very good reason, you know, playing with the U.S. Under 23 team in Concacaf Olympic qualifying. And I know it, it didn't end the way you wanted it, obviously, to uh, with a spot in the Olympics, but you did get that experience of playing in a big time international competition. So we haven't really had a chance to talk about it too much yet, but just you know, what were the emotions for you that first time you walk in the locker room, you see a US jersey with Kessler across the back, you see the US crest, you pull it on, you walk out into an international competition, you hear the anthem. Like I, I gotta imagine that there's a ton of emotion that goes on the first time you experience that. There's a lot, a lot for sure. It was kind of a, a surreal moment. Um, for me, it was different. So, uh, the first game, 
um, you know, I, I knew I wasn't really in the lineup. Uh, so while it was, it was crest, everything, um, I was still, I, I was prepared to play in case I got stuff done, whatever, but it's, uh, your preparation mentally is I think slightly different, um, just because, you know, you're not going to get on the field immediately. Um, so the emotions hadn't peaked at like the start of the game, so to say second game, um, I knew I was starting. So emotions were a little bit different. You know, you're in the locker room getting ready, getting ready for the game. Um, that, that there was more anticipation for me. Um, so that I felt more. And then being on the field, hearing the anthem, uh, really surreal. Um, my mom said she got pretty emotional watching that, you know, so, so that was, that was a big moment for me. Um, and then the next game against Mexico, huge game, right? Biggest rival. Um, and that only being my second international uh, appearance at, at any age group, you know, was, was another big game. So each game, and then the third one being a knockout stage game. Um, so each game presented uh, sort of different um, challenges and uh, different, different emotions. And now I know you obviously before making that first national team appearance had been looking forward to that opportunity. You were hungry for that opportunity, but having gotten that little taste of it when you left that camp, if possible, were you, were you even hungrier for more national team opportunities and full national team opportunities, just kind of having gotten that taste of, of wearing that crest? Yeah, the initial response was a uh, devastation, um, re really upset, um, you know, and, and it didn't help like the hearing like the Taylor Twelmans and like everyone saying that, you know, we had failed, stuff like that. Um, so, so that hurt. But um, after, you know, after I kind of got over that, got back into the, the revs, you know, and then kind of moved on from there, I haven't really thought about um, the national team so much since. Um, but obviously I look forward to any and every opportunity that I have. Um, but yeah, I think it was, there, there wasn't really much time to think, um, you know, I was, it was like more upset and then got back to things with revs and, you know, was hundred percent thinking about revs. So um, there hasn't been a ton of time to think about what the national team holds for me in the future. But um, yeah, like I said, every, every opportunity is great. That experience kind of helped propel you into preseason with the Revs. I know we talked about earlier how, you know, you're still building that partnership with Andrew Farrell for this year, but as far as learning a little bit of a different style and putting yourself in a different sort of system, how did that help you when you came back, just have a little more versatility and understanding when you rejoin the team? Yeah, I think it helps me personally, um, you know, being able to play in different systems, being more familiar with different systems. Uh, I'm not sure how much it helped with uh, me being, you know, with revs. Um, obviously, I missed three out of five preseason games. So, so that. Um, but, you know, I think for my personal development, it was good. Um, and then obviously, there are some things that I can take away and uh, that I learned there and can use here and implement in my game now. Um, which I think is helpful, but, uh, you know, at, I wish, it, I wish the timing was a little different. So it, ideally the tournament would have been earlier and I would have had a, you know, a full preseason with the Rev still, but like you said, there are some things that I can. Oh, we lost Henry. Did we lose Henry again? Hey, yeah, he frozen? He's frozen. Oh, no, he's you back. Do we have Henry? Hello. Hello. Oh, we got you back. Hi. <laughs> we got you hi, back. Hi, hi. We're yeah, good. Sorry. We're good. When um, when did I cut off? Just right right at the end. So I think okay. I think we're good. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, you mentioned you know obviously Elizabeth mentioned a little bit of a different system, maybe even playing in some different spots. I know you know people have a tendency maybe to think center back is center back, and you don't think about you know right center back and left center back is kind of two different spots. But I know in one of the games with the U.S., you were on the right side of that center back pairing for a little bit. You've typically played on the left side of the center back pairing with the Revs. You know, what are the little differences between being on the left side and the right side of a center back partnership? And do you have a preference of you know, which side to be on? Do you feel more comfortable on one side? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think there is a difference, um, especially, you know, just body shape, the way you receive the ball, uh, how you plan to use which foot to pass the ball. Um, so these are, these are things that, that change the position. So for example, if I get the ball right center back and I get the ball from Matt Turner, plays it out to me, 
and I want to play the next pass ideally with my right foot because it's better than my left, even though my, my left isn't bad. <laughs> but um, ideally play with my right. The touch is going to be different. You know, the touch is going to be slightly more outside my body. Whereas if I'm playing left center back, the touch is going to be with my left foot, you know, trying to prep it for my right. Um, so little things like that are different. Um, I don't have a preference. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm really comfortable on the left. I've played there a lot. You know, that's my last year of college was on the left. This past year was on the left. So I played the left a lot recently. Um, but there's a reason why most righties play on the right side, um, <laughs> because I think that that's generally considered easier. But um, yeah, so I, I like playing both sides. But as you said, there are, there are differences between the two. And just kind of finishing up on the CONCACAF Olympic qualifying, I wanted to ask about Tejon because you're obviously down at the competition, very focused and honed in with the U.S. and the task at hand for you guys. But at the same time, you've got a friend and teammate who's with the Canadian side as well. And obviously he goes out in that first game and scores two incredible goals. Like, What was it like for you kind of watching Tejon come to the forefront a little bit and be a little bit of a focal point with that Canadian team while you were playing in a competition, knowing that the two of you could have ended up coming up against each other too? Yeah, it was exciting. It was exciting. Um, you know, we were texting during the tournament. Um, I didn't want to text him too much in case like we did end up playing each other. Um, so I didn't want to be too friendly. But um, yeah, you know, he obviously had a great first game. Um, and I was proud to watch two goals. You know, it was good, good to see that. Um, and he looked really confident, which I love to see. Um, so it was exciting watching him. And uh, he told me, he told me after the tournament, you know, he was watching some of our games, la laughing when I, when I hit guys or, you know, tackled guys, whatever it was. Um, so we, we watched each other's games and it was a, you know, a special experience that we got to share somewhat. Well, then you came straight into LA and you mentioned you traveled from Guadalajara to LA together. You had to go through the five day quarantine process together. And that meant when you were doing your training sessions for those five games, it was just the two of you. So basically, I mean, you, you had a whole lot of, 1v1 drills against Tejon. So kind of what, what was that like just kind of having that competitive edge where every day was basically you 1v1 with Tejon? Yeah, yeah, we got pretty close. We got pretty close <laughs> over, the, uh, over the five days. So I'll, I'll take it back to even the flight over. So uh, Tejon texted me, hey, what time's your flight? Uh, so his flight is at 9 a.m. Uh, Guadalajara time. So I end up being on the same flight. So we see each other in the airport, right? We land in LAX, and um, so they go, oh, where are you coming from? I'm coming from Mexico. This is at Customs. Mm -hmm. And um, coming from Guadalajara Olympic qualifying tournament, whatever, um, here in LA for preseason, right? Tejan basically says the same thing, but he goes, <laughs> they say a, f a few other questions, right? They go, oh, wh so where do you live? He says, Boston. They're like, why were you in Guadalajara? Oh, I was in Guadalajara for this tournament. They're like, but you have a Canadian passport. And he said, yeah, I'm from Toronto. And then they go, so what are you doing in LA? He said, I'm playing in LA too. So all of a sudden he mentioned, he mentioned four different cities and like the, the TSA guys are like, what's up with this guy? You know? So, so then they held him in the airport for like oh, a good no. two and a half hours at LA. It was crazy. Yeah. So I'm glad they finally released him. And then uh, from there we made our way to the hotel. So there was a bit of delay after that. But um, yeah, and then the days, I'm glad I had someone else to train with, you know, which was great. Um, but yeah, a lot of one-on-ones. Um, the first days were a bit lighter because we were still, you know, recovering from, from Tejan played four games in 13 days. For me, it was three games in eight days. So a lot of games. So mm -hmm. we were taking it like the first couple of days. But um, yeah, then after that, a lot of 1v1s. And at times it got pretty intense. So, but it, I was happy to have someone to train with. Elizabeth, did you have a question? You seemed like you were going to ask something. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask, not that there's winners and losers when you're training together in a pair <laughs> of two, but when you're playing 1v1, if you were to pick a winner between you and Tejon, who would it be? It, it would be me. It would be me. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, but I had to ask. <laughs> I'm sure Tejon would say differently. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would. I was just going to say, like, I get, I get, that uh, the customs, like they're, they're always pretty tight with stuff, but like, you'd like to think that throughout the course of a day, there's gotta be a bunch of people who are like bouncing from city to city or from one place, but are living somewhere else and traveling somewhere else. Like that can't be the most ridiculous. I can't be like, Oh my God, I can't believe this person is coming through LA. What are they doing? Like, 
I don't know. I get when three different, like three different countries are involved. He's from Canada, but he lives in the U S and he's coming from Mexico. Maybe it raised questions, but like, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like it's the craziest thing in the yeah. world. Yeah. Well, when you said it at first, uh, you were like, Oh, they asked him a few more questions. I was like, why would that matter? And then you mentioned the Canadian passport and I was like, Oh, that's the difference maker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If he's, if he's ever on, because he was telling me some, some crazy things that were happening in that room while he was just locked up. They, they told me to wait downstairs. So they're like, no, you can't wait with him. So I just waited by baggage claim, but you'll have to ask him about it. Wow. All right. I'm, I'm going to need those details. I think. <laughs> um, all right. Well, when you, when you guys got to, to LA, that was really, you mentioned you'd left in February for national team camp. So it was really your first chance to kind of get on the field with the, the 2021 revs. And they, they look a little different than they did in, in 2020. And especially for you, it was part of that center back group, you know, Antonio De La Mea and Michael Mancini were part of that group last year. They're no longer with the revs. You've got AJ De La Garza, uh, John Bell coming up from revs to Colin Verfirth, who was with the squad last year, but spent a lot of time with revs too. So it's a little bit of a different center back group now. So how has that group kind of come together and pushed each other through preseason and into the, the start of the year? Yeah, I think it's been a good group. Um, obviously, you know, the two guys from last year were, were more veteran guys, learn things from them. Um, these, this group is a bit younger, but, um, you know, energetic, uh, athletic, um, strong, good size, tall. Um, so I think, I think it's a good group and we all push each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I got there, I was impressed with, uh, what I saw from the guys. Um, so clearly they, they have been doing well the first three weeks, four weeks of preseason, so, um, yeah, no, I've, I've been impressed and I, I think uh, the whole group's done well and, and will continue to do so. I know he's not a center back, but one of the guys who everybody seems to have raved about, and I loved what I saw from him on the field was Maciel. You know, in the limited time you've had a chance to see Maciel, a guy who's coming up from Revs too. Uh, how have you seen him kind of settling into the, the MLS level? Because from you know, our sort of perspective, he looks like he fits at that level pretty seamlessly. Yeah, he's done really well from the limited sample size that I've had. He's done really well, um, you know, passes that break lines, not just going side to side, um, composed on the ball. Um, you know, obviously he's, he's working on his English, doesn't talk so much, but um, I've tried to talk with him as much as possible, make him feel comfortable. Um, but yeah, I've been impressed what I've, w with what I've seen so far and, uh, you know, hoping he, he returns from injury soon, you know, so we can get him back on the field. And I know he's one of uh, he's one of nine new faces you have in the squad. You're coming off that run to the Eastern Conference final last year. So, you know, from the outside, expectations are unquestionably on the rise for 2021. And I'm interested, you know, where you kind of fall on that, because I know some guys avoid kind of all media about their team and themselves. Some guys love to kind of soak up all of the media about themselves and the team. Some guys soak it all up, but then lie and say that they don't look at any of it. You know, kind of where do you fall in terms of, you know, predictions for the season and stories about you and stories about the team and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I try to avoid it. And I'm not one of the guys that's just lying, saying I try to avoid <laughs> it, um, to be clear. But, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we – our expectations are more important than the media's expectations. Um, and we have high expectations for our team this year. You know, we think it's a team that can win trophies and, and do really well. So, um that's what we're focused on. Um, I don't pay too much attention um, to other people's expectations, thoughts, predictions. Um, as a matter of fact, I try to avoid them. But, um, yeah, it, it, they don't mean a ton to me. Who cares? Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Who cares? What, what kind of expectations do you have for yourself? Because obviously you had a really successful rookie year in major league soccer you're a guy who holds yourself to a high standard so do you kind of set goals and expectations for yourself I know obviously it's not like a forward who can go and say well I want to score 10 goals this year I want to score 15 goals this year but do you kind of set you know goals expectations for yourself as an individual yeah it's less of a quantitative position um you know you can't really sometimes you can't really put numbers on it um but I would like to build off what I did last year um you know improve in all areas of my I think that would be beneficial for the team. You know, Bruce, Bruce always talks about, oh, you know, center back should be getting three, four goals a year. 
last year I just had the one. So I'm hoping to get three or four goals this year. Um, and then, then he can stop telling me to score. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, work, work on a few things, build on what, what we and I did last year. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure there's, there's too many pinpoint things that, that I can say. Henry, is there any role model from either the Revs or another team that you try to aspire to be like throughout your career? I know you're so young and you've had one year in the league, but has there been a player that you've seen and you're like, I want to be like him? Uh, it's a good question. Um, for out, outside the team, sure, someone, just their work ethic and their career longevity, everything is Cristiano. Um, I, I don't think you can go wrong with that. Um, obviously he's had a great career and he's still going at 36, um, you know, being one of the top mm -hmm. players in the world. So, um, I like in terms of work ethic and everything, I try to be a lot like him, you know, just pushing myself to the limits, making sure, cause there's always something you could do more. Um, you know, always staying after training, doing extras, going in the gym, doing more, feeding myself properly, getting the right amount of rest, stuff like that. So there's a lot that goes into it off the field. Um, and, and I think he does a great job, you know, his book, I've read his book. He says some stuff about that. Also his movie's pretty good. Um, so yeah, I try to model work ethic stuff off the field after him. Um, in terms of anyone. Help me come back. Um, in again. Oh, okay. I was going to say we lost you for like two seconds. There. I was like, yeah. hopefully he doesn't say who it is while we lost him. You're no, I, I didn't. I, okay. Um, but yeah, I, I was just saying, uh, I've yet to determine, um, who on the revs, you know, I really model myself after, um, and I'm, I'm not sure there will be one answer, uh, mm -hmm. just cause you know, I've, I've had a year with the team, but you know, I, you know, it's hard to say, cause you don't see what people really do outside of the facility. Yeah. So, whereas with Ronaldo, everything's documented, you know, this guy has got cameras everywhere. So, um, it's easier to follow. But um, yeah, there, there are certainly guys that, um, you know, take good care of themselves and do the right things. I think that that's, that's all the guys. Um, but yeah, so not one in particular would be my answer. Okay. Ronaldo's a great answer though for outside the team. <laughs> Can't go wrong. Can't, Can't go, go wrong. wrong. <laughs> First of all, I'd say from a content perspective, we're, we're always willing to have cameras everywhere all the time. So if you guys <laughs> are willing to have us have cameras there. We're ca it's we'll true. capture everything. So we can, We'll talk about that later. We'll just we'll just have cameras all over the place. But I also want to say with Ronaldo, I just want to clarify. I think 36 is still very young. I think that that is a, a perfect <laughs> age for someone to still be an elite professional athlete is 36 years old. No reason for that. I just think 36 is a great age for an, for an elite professional athlete. No personal <laughs> bias. A little bit of a sidebar on that. It, it I think I still love like Ronaldo. Hey, Sorry, what's that, Henry? You know, proven, proven that he's he's still young. Yeah, can still do it. So I mean, guys can do it. It can be done. Yeah, I just have to. I have to get myself to that level at 36, rather than keep myself at that level at 36. I've got to get there for the first time at 36, which is tougher. But well, I'll get there. It'll be fine. All right. <laughs> We're just, my as, set. <laughs> <laughs> as we start to wrap up, we mentioned it way back at the beginning of the show that uh, you guys are looking towards this home opener on Saturday night against DC United and the storyline that is going to dwarf, dwarf all other storylines. The fact that supporters fans are back in the stands for the first time since the home opener last year. And that's to this point, the only game you have gotten to play at Gillette stadium in front of fans was that home debut, the home opener. Um, what do you think the emotions are going to be like for you and the rest of the team on Saturday night when for the first time in 14 months, you get to take the field in front of the fans. Yeah, emotions are certainly going to be high. Um, you know, I think we're all excited to have the fans back in the stadium. Um, I'm not sure. Do, what is the capacity? Do we do we know that? It'll be a little under 8,000. A little under 8,000. Okay. So i um, excited to have the fans back. Um, you know, they mean a lot to us. Their support means a lot to us. Um, and they encourage us. I think they help us on the field, you know, cheering, enthusiasm, whatever it is, um, you know, I think that helps us. So uh, I'll be, I'll be really excited. And I think all the guys are to have them back. What kind of game are you expecting from this DC United team? Because it's been interesting and kind of watching uh, with the new head coach coming this year, Hernan Lozada, who has kind of 
you know, he's, he's been very vocal about the fact that he wants his group to be one of the fitter teams in the league. He wants them to have a lot of energy. He has said he wants them to be annoying to play against. It's that type of team he wants to build. We kind of saw that in their opener against New York City FC, where they were just really difficult to break down, uh, particularly as they come into your house and your home opener. You know, what, what kind of battle are you expecting against this D.C. United team? A tough one. I'm expecting a tough game. Great result against NYCFC. Um, perhaps not too many people expected that after last year's standings, but you know they did really well, scored two really good goals. Um, so we're expecting a team that will press us, put us put us under some pressure, um, and as you say, be difficult to play against. So um, I, I'm expecting a difficult game, um, but you know nothing that we can't handle. And then just to to finish up, last topic. I feel like I've I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like I've seen you post on social media about Arsenal. Are you an Arsenal? supporter about sorry what arsenal arsenal yeah 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 an arsenal fan so how did i just when did when did that start how did arsenal kind of become your your team so arsenal became my club a while ago um this is right so my dad played american football and lacrosse my mom played basketball so they weren't they weren't really soccer fans. So this is when we were starting, my brother and my sisters starting to get into soccer um, and we were choosing a team. And so there were some criteria. They had to be on TV. Um, so we had to be able to watch them. And so Arsenal Premier League really was like the most televised league. Um, and then we figured if we're going to pick a team, we may as well enjoy watching them. So, so that's how we got to Arsenal. Um, and, you know, at the time when I started becoming a fan, it was kind of, right after their peak. So it was mostly United on top, but um, yeah, you know, lots of, lots of great guys. Like, uh, you know, this was one Jack Wilshere was great. Um, Aaron Ramsey, Lauren Koscielny. So all those guys uh, I'm big fans of, um, but yeah, that, that's how we got to Arsenal. Oh, so you just, you just missed out on that invincibles group with like Bergkamp and Henri and Vieira and all those guys just after that just Robert after Perez. that unfortunately. yeah oh, I want to yeah. say 2006 maybe yeah is when when we started really becoming fans so unfortunately miss miss the golden era but um it's yet to come there's another one coming all right fair enough you, you do have a lot of support too I mean Brad Knighton I believe an Arsenal supporter Charlie Davies Tim Crawford our analyst a massive Arsenal fan so there's a you got a lot of Arsenal brethren in that training center. There's a lot of us. There's a lot of us. And I would, I would be remiss. I, I couldn't let you go having brought up Arsenal. I have to ask because it's obviously been the topic the past couple of days. And now all of the English clubs have, you know, withdrawn from the European Super League. But what was kind of your initial reaction when you saw the news that those six English clubs and obviously some other top teams in you know, Italy, Spain, Germany were, were going to, to break away? Uh, actually, we're, I don't even think there were German, German clubs that so were going to break away uh, to that European Super League. My initial reaction was not to overreact and get, get all the details. Because honestly, I, I knew very little. I heard just people in uproar about this European Super League, so I wanted to know more about it. Um, as far as I knew, it would not to leave like the Premier League or anything like that. It was an additional competition. Um, but that being said, it seemed like there was nothing at stake, um, you know, and other than money, because uh, I believe the proposed winner would get 400 million, which is which is a lot compared to the Champions League. I think it's 120 million. So more than three times as much. Um, but other than that, other than money, there didn't seem to be a, another factor. So I think on that front, it wouldn't have been too successful. And obviously, since all the teams have pulled out and the league's been suspended, but um, there was an interesting quote from Florentino Perez, the uh, Real Madrid um, general manager. I don't think he's the owner. Um, maybe he is the owner. But anyways, he said they lost $400 million last year, which is uh, an issue for them. Um, so I think financially, you know, I think the system is changing. I don't know if you saw either today or yesterday, the Champions League announced a new format. Um, to be put into place in 2024. Um, and I think additional games will be played, therefore additional revenue. Um, but I think, and then here, here's my Arsenal bias, but this is uh, something that Arsene Wenger said 10 years ago, 
is that this was going to happen eventually. So uh, certainly I think this is the direction we're trending um, to kind of get all those top teams in one competition. But um, as for now, I think the Champions League does a good job of that. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more change coming. Yeah, it did almost feel in the end like it was it was just going to be uh, something that ended up enacting change in the Champions League, right? I just felt like, okay, well, this probably isn't going to happen, but maybe it's just to kind of push some change along in the Champions League. So, all right, good to get your take on that. Yeah. Kind of had to ask that question at this point, obviously. But Henry, sure. uh, very much appreciate your take and almost an hour out of your uh, day to, to sit and chat with us about uh, a variety of different topics. As always, it's been enlightening. It's been fun. Uh, very much appreciate you taking the time. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the field on Saturday night in that home opener against DC United when you get back in front of the fans. Sounds good. Thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you soon on the Far Post Podcast presented by Esports Gaming.